watching the Vision Channel, where Habakkuk 2 and 2 says, write the vision and make it plain, so they that see it can take it and run with it. This is the channel where faith and vision collide to bring forth a manifestation. You're watching the Vision Channel. I would like to welcome you to our broadcast tonight. I know we had a couple of challenges, but tonight we thank God for everything that God wanted to do or desires to do tonight. You know, I, I think tonight, one thing that I can say that I love about God, I, I love about God, that that God is a, He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You know, I think in Hebrew chapter 11, verse 6, the Bible said, without faith, it is impossible to please God. But God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So sometimes God would intervene in your life and he'll come sometimes as a rewarder after you diligently seek him. <laughs> In Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 13, this is how you find God. The Bible said that God said, when you seek for me with your whole heart, then you'll find me. So it's seeking. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7 said, ask, seek, and knock. There is a, there, there is a method that God have in order for you to find him. Now, I want you to please hear this because most people think that there's a method and way how you come to God to get things. But God is saying, I don't want you to come to seek me for the thing. I need you to come seek me for me. So when you seek God for God, then you will see God as you seek him. You do know the root word of the word seek is see. And God will always allow you to see him. When Moses would always come onto the mountain, Moses would always get the opportunity to see God. Why? Because Moses would see God out. And I think in this season and in this hour, God is looking for the body of Christ to go back to seek him. Seek your first love. Seek him again. And God will show you that as you seek me, you'll find me. This is the hour to seek God more than what we ever have. And I'll say this <clears throat> before I get into my topic. I'm going to say this. And I know, and I know that we, um, we have come across and we have given many things to God. You know, last year you gave him this, you know, the year before you gave him that. God, I'm giving you my time. God, I'm giving you my first fruits. I'm giving you offering. I'm giving you my tithes. And, and sometimes you can get in a cycle and in the cycle that you get in, you keep giving the same thing over and over and over again, but there is no extension of your faith. And God is saying that what you've given me is good, but now I'm calling for a greater sacrifice. Sometimes God needs you to give more than what you've ever had, more time. Not money, not recesses, but he said, I need you to give me more of you. Can you give me more time? Can you give me your heart? Because if you can give me more, I can reveal more of myself. The more I gave myself to see God, the more he revealed to me, the more he revealed about me. I'll never forget this before we get into our topic. I will never forget this. I remember God showed me a vision and in this vision, there was this huge light and I was walking in that light. Listen, I was, I, I had learned how to fast and I was praying. I was reading my Bible. I had, I had literally disconnected myself from the world completely. And all I wanted was God. And what God was showing me, the more that I walked in the light, the more he was revealing to me about how much about me that I needed to give up more. And the more that I gave up, the more that he revealed, he revealed my identity. He revealed my name. He revealed my purpose. He revealed my destiny. He even revealed who my wife would be. He revealed the more that I gave up, the more that I saw him, the more he revealed unto me. Listen to me. So some of us, if you really want to know your resolve, you really want to know your answer. You really want to know what your expected is, is, is 
you need to seek God more in this season. And, and, and God don't want what you gave him last year. He don't want what you gave him the first part of the year. He want to know if you're serious. Can you give me more? You know, there was a song by one of these artists. They said, okay, um, I'm trying to think of the, um, the lyrics. And one of the lyrics said, um, I know what you gave me, but what have you done lately? That come from one of the Jacksons. What have you done for me lately? And God is saying, I don't want the same thing. If you ate steak every day, how, how much would you desire the same steak? You've ate it for 30 days. You didn't saute it. You didn't fry it. You didn't smother it. You didn't did everything that you can possibly do. So you've eaten it for 30 days. It's just, see, some of our worship, because we have done it so long, is stale. Because you're now doing it out of the traditions of men. And God is saying, no, I need you to seek me so that I can show you how to find me. But you need to do it in another way. And God is saying, I need a greater sacrifice for you in this season. I need more time with you in this season. Because when you reveal, when you give me more time, then I can restore time. I can redeem time and I can seal time and preserve your time. But you have to seek me and give me more time. Nobody, would you go to the store and buy a pack of potato chips and you open the bag and they're stale? Who wants stale potato chips? Who wants spoiled milk? Who wants rotten meat? Nobody wants it. So sometimes God is looking for you to do something outside of the season, something that you are customarily used to. God is saying, give me more in this season. Give me more of your heart. And that's one of the things that's, that's resonating in my spirit. Give me more of your heart. I need your heart. Give me more of your heart. And I know we're used to saying and we're accustomed to saying, Lord, less of me and more of you. And God is saying, you've been saying that too long. But God is saying, I don't want <laughs> less of me. I don't want none of you so that you can have all of me. I don't want that to be none of you so you can have all of me. All right, tonight I'm not going to be long. I'm going to, I'm going to talk about this topic tonight. Now, this topic to me is a, it's, it's a strong topic. It's a strong topic because this topic, some people don't want to hear it. Some people don't understand it. This topic, this, this topic here is one of the things that has corrupted this entire earth. It has corrupted this entire earth, and many of us truly don't know how these things operate or how it works. We see it, but we don't understand it. So tonight we're going to be talking about lust. Lust which deals with seduction. Lust which deal with temptation. You know, we're going to talk about tonight lust. We're going to talk about how it works. It has destroyed many people in the body of Christ. Lust has destroyed some of the greats, even the old, even the prophets, even some of the kings. Lust has destroyed. My God, I'm getting excited. Lust has destroyed. And oftentimes we don't know when lust came in, how it comes in. And lust can have generational ramifications, generational effects. We can open doors to one spirit. Many doors can be open to one spirit. You know, one of the things that I want, I, I truly want us to understand because I'm going to talk about spiritual things, spiritual matters. Now I'm going to use some natural references tonight and we're going to go through scriptures. We're going to go through scriptures and I'm going to just show you how significant and how impactful this one spirit is. This one spirit can draw you completely away from God. Let me tell you this. Oftentimes, and I'll, I'll give you kind of, I'll give kind of give you a reference. Man, I'm I'm, I'm trying to go too far. I'm going, I'm trying to go too far. I'm going too far because so many scriptures are popping up in my head. Let me read this foundational scripture first. Let me read this foundational scripture first, and then we'll get into it. Now I'm going to talk about James chapter one and verse twelve, and I'm probably going to read through verse fifteen. I'm reading verse twelve. 
just to give, give, give us an understanding, it says, blessed is the man that endured temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Verse 13, say, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust have conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, it brings forth death. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Notice it takes a personal approach when it said every man is tempted by his own lust. Do you know how lust comes in? Do you know that lust spirits of lust can be territorial? Spirits of lust can be territorial. You can walk in an atmosphere or an environment, not understanding that the second you step your foot in a certain place, those spirits themselves that are territorial will take over the entire region. They will consume your body, and you won't even know why you're having dreams, having visions. Let me give you one of my personal testimonies. Sometimes, you know, I, I know there's a verse that says you must try the spirit by the spirit. And sometimes we think it's just from a humanistic standpoint to what we think, and okay, I'm going to get by you and you're going to come to me. I'm going to see, I'm going to see what kind of spirit you got in you. And some, and that's a great way of form of fashion of looking at it. And even though that's the foundation stage, that is the stage that some people normally look at it because I'm going to discern what kind of spirit you got. I'm having the discerning of spirits. It's a gift. It's one of the gifts. And that's a good thing. But sometimes God will allow you to discern what spirit don't have a body. You can get in an atmosphere. <laughs> you can get in an atmosphere and you can know that some spirits don't have bodies, period. If you are sensitive and all of a sudden something, something will go off in your spirit that say something about this place ain't right. I may not be able to put my finger on it, but I know the second I stepped in here, I got a headache. The second I stepped in here, I got sick. There's some atmospheres and environments that you can go in, and all of a sudden, you know just based on your spirit will let you know that something is not right in this atmosphere or in this environment. Let me explain to you what I'm in reference to. I never forget. I was driving to work one morning. I was driving to work one morning. And as I'm driving to work, all of a sudden there is a water burger. I'm on the freeway. These restaurants is on the feeder. I'm driving to work at five o'clock in the morning. As I'm driving, all of a sudden my spirit goes off. My spirit goes off, Lord Jesus. My spirit goes off. And when my spirit go off, I look to my right and there's a strip club. There's a strip club and my spirit automatically goes into war. I start speaking in tongues. I automatically went into war. Automatically. Because my spirit was waging wars with spirits that was in that club. It, it, and, and, and God was telling me that cars are passing by unaware that these spirits were looking for bodies. They were looking to inhabit bodies. That See, one thing about a spirit don't need a car to catch up with you. It's a spirit. It doesn't need a key to get in your door. You cannot lock your doors and think the spirit can't come in. No, anybody that pass by that place of perversion, anybody that drove by it, automatically something would transpire and something would take place just by you driving by. And there was one person, I, I want to say where the club at, but I'm not going to say it. 
There was one person, they went into Whataburger. They went into Whataburger, and one of the things they, I, I was telling them about that God was expressing to me that when you even get around these places, these spirits, these because the strip clubs are nothing more than portals. I, I'm telling you this when I say this stuff is territorial. How did the strip club get access to land or property or building? How did it get past the city council? How did it happen? They are taking territory. These powers are taking territory in this perversion. So any child that passed by, that those childs are plagued by the spirits that's in that place. Why do you think it's so inviting? Why do you think they have barbecues and bar mitzvah? I mean, not bar mitzvah, they have barbecues and they have buffets and they have sports because they know it's going to draw men. They know it's going to draw women. They allow you to come into this place only to establish a covenant. But the spirits, watch this, the people that established this, these strip clubs, it's territorial. They're all about taking the territory. And one of the persons just went in the restaurant next to it, a Whataburger. And all of a sudden, they're standing in line. And they start telling me about their thoughts, their imagination. All of a sudden, they felt something come upon them. And I told them, I said, if you're about this place, then those spirits make sure that anybody that comes to this restaurant, those spirits inhabit bodies. So this is why you're having the thoughts, the imagination, because these spirits are territorial. God said, he told me, most people don't know. There was another time that I got ready to go into Dallas. And 30 miles outside of Dallas, I'm going to the right. The strip club is on the left. And all of a sudden, ah, my spirit goes off again. And God has allowed me to see the exact same thing. These spirits are catching people going into Dallas and coming out of Dallas. And they're leaving with something that they didn't know that they were going to have. They're territorial. I'll give you a prime example, something natural. Your prime example, I remember one time... I went to um, <laughs> I went to Las Vegas. I used to play basketball, so we had a basketball convention in Las Vegas. Now I was a young guy. I wasn't a preacher. I was young, and when I went to Las Vegas, my first time ever going to Las Vegas for one of the one of the uh, basketball nationals that they had there. And when I went there, I was surprised. I was looking around, I was like, man, these women are half naked, what's going on? I, I was blown away. I get to my hotel, I'm staying in the hotel with, a, with one of my friends, I, I'm looking around like, look on the counter, they have books, literally. Yeah, books that you can get escorts, call them, and they'll come. They have legalized prostitution in Las Vegas. You know what the saying is in Las Vegas? What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Even though that's the phrase, but you don't know when you go to Vegas because they have legalized prostitution. What happens in Vegas never stays in Vegas. It leaves with you because you've established a covenant. And those spirits, if you're not careful, will follow you home. They'll attack your children. They'll attack your wife. The greatest challenge that we have around the world, and I want you to hear this astounding number when it comes to perversion, lust, I want you to see this astounding number. I did some research today and it said, do you know that the pornography business, how much it makes annually? It makes $97 billion annually. Look how many people are impacted just by that industry. It has consumed the entire, almost the entire world population. So whoever creates this industry, it's the one that's rich and everybody is being infected by it. 97 billion with a B dollars. These spirits are territorial. You know, one of the things that that I want to say that when it comes to this spirit of lust, notice what is stated in the scripture that it said, every man is drawn away and enticed, but what is he drawn away from? 
you're always drawn away from Christ by this spirit. Many people scripturally, I've seen pastors fall because of this spirit. Let me, okay, let me tell you how it works, okay, for pastors. If you're a pastor tonight and you're listening to me, let me show you how it works, okay? Let me show you how this power, these spirits work, okay? Let me show you how it works. So when a person comes to your church, they come with a seducing spirit. They come dressed up. They leave nothing to the imagination, whether they're men or whether they're women. It doesn't matter. The main objective is they carry the spirit of perversion. So when they come to your church, they listen to you preach. They hear you pray. And after service, they want to come shake your hand or hug you. Not understanding that spirits transfer. So just by one embrace, after of you preach and you were tired, y'all, and I'll give you a prime example about you being tired. When you look in the book of Kings, first Kings, first Kings, I think it's in chapter 18, chapter 19, after Elijah had killed 850 prophets of Baal, but with his own hands. He was exhausted, and then Jezebel sends him a word in exhaustion. And all of a sudden, the spirit of suicide, fear, intimidation comes upon Elijah, and Elijah runs from his assignment after he killed her prophets. Look at what takes place when a person is exhausted. So they wait until a person finishes the service, and then they embrace them so they don't have the spiritual aptitude nor the strength to be able to fight the spirit of perversion. And oftentimes they become victimized by the spirits. So let me give it to you. Let me, <laughs> and most pastors start having thoughts, start having imaginations, start having dreams because the spirit was transferred. And if you don't know, then you'll start thinking the greatest issue that we have is that we don't understand that when it comes to this spirit, we get upset with people because they're pedophiles. They chase children, harass children, look at children, want to molest children, molest us. We look at pedophiles. We look at those that have desire for the same sex. We don't understand what's transpiring and taking us. Let me tell you about the spirit of lust. The spirit of lust don't care if you're a man or woman. It don't care if you're a goat, frog, or dog. It doesn't matter. All the spirit of lust desires to do is to satisfy itself. So this is what God calls abomination. You have people sleeping with animals, people sleeping with dogs, and people sleeping with sheep, and people sleeping with horses. It doesn't matter. The spirit of lust is operating in that individual's life. We're calling them perverts, but a pervert carries that spirit of perversion. And I told you, you can get in certain places in its territory. Las Vegas is a place that is plagued by that spirit. Give you a prime example. Scripture, you remember, I know everybody remember the name Jezebel. Jezebel, remember Jezebel? Jezebel married Ahab. And if Jezebel married Ahab, the first thing that transpired with Jezebel she served Baal, a paganistic God. So when she married Ahab, the first thing that she did, watch this, was take God out of the temple. She said, if, we, if I'm going to be here with you, then we have to worship Baal. Every man is tempted and drawn away by his own lust and enticed. She carried the spirit of perversion and Ahab couldn't tell her no. So he pushed God out. And brought Baal in. And now an entire nation would serve Baal. They would have orgies inside of God's temple. They would erect Asherah poles. Asherah poles always dealt with a woman that was carved by a tree. Or they had a woman on some type of pole. Okay. And they were naked. I'll give you a prime example that you can look at some forms or similarities of Asherah poles because they had breasts on the poles, breasts on the trees, they had breasts. So when you go in department stores, you look at mannequins, 
that was like a symbolization of an asteroid pole. When you go in strip clubs, let me tell y'all something. When you go in strip clubs, that's why you have certain women on poles or men. I'm just, it's a universal principle. You can have some men, chipmunk dancers or whatever they call them, blue chips, whatever they call them. You can have men or women on these poles, but it's a sign and it's going back and it's dating back to where when Jezebel had these asteroid poles and when men or women go in, they steal their virtue. When you look at NBA basketball players, the reason they lose their ability to play basketball is because their virtue is being stolen, stolen by them going to strip clubs. And you don't see them, and all of a sudden their body becomes frail. All of a sudden they keep getting hurt. They can't play at the capacity that they did because of the covenant they established with lust. Why? All because it was territorial. Why did I talk about Jezebel? Why? Because Jezebel carried a seducing spirit. It was a seducing spirit. Even when King Ahab died, when he died, she was walking on the wall and started putting on perfume. She was trying to seduce Jehu. And the Bible said Jehu called, push off. Who's on the Lord's side? Push her off the wall. He had to kill that spirit that was controlling that region. The spirit of Jezebel or the spirit of lust was so strong, you have to go all the way back to Jesus with the woman on the well. When Jesus came to the woman, what, what type of woman she was? She was a woman of Samaria where the first covenant was established with Jezebel. So when Jesus went to Samaria, he didn't go in it. He stayed at the well on the outside of it. He said, listen, watch this. The woman said, you know the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritan. She already knew. Jesus said, you're right. Okay, but if you, can, can you let, give me something to drink? And she, listen, 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 I don't have nothing to draw out the water with. He said, but if you knew who you were talking to, you would ask me for living water. With this water, you'll never thirst again. Now, I want you to hear what I'm getting ready to say. Why am I saying this? Jesus told the woman. I want you to see how this covenant works. Jesus tells the woman this. He says, where is your husband? And she said, I don't have one. He said, you're right. You don't have a husband. You've had five. And the one that you are with, the one that you are with right now is not your husband. And Jesus watched this. And the lady said she perceived that he was a prophet. She perceived that he was a prophet. She drops her water pot, runs back into the city where lust is, where perversion is where temptation is because she slept with six men. And when she went back into the city, she said, come see a man that told me everything about me. Everything about her life was connected to lust and perversion. Why? Because Samaria, that covenant was still established when she went in the city. So in order to break it, he needed to use a woman that everybody slept with, that everybody knew. She said, come see a man that told me everything about me, everything about her. She, she, she could have been a modern day prostitute. Because everything about her, but the land itself, that spirit controlled what was in the land because of the covenants. Whether we understand it or not, there are some territorial spirits that govern land, period. It will control everything within that region, everything within that territory. I was telling, I was telling the church that God allowed me to pastor I was telling them the first time that God had showed me a principality. First time. I was at work. And by me being at work, I'll never forget. I, I was walking down one of the sidewalks. And I looked up. And when I looked up, I saw this red being that probably stood about 90 foot tall. Messed me up. And I'll never forget its words. 
It said, we are waiting for you. What? And I thought something was wrong with me at the time. Am I, am I going crazy? Did I just see what I thought I saw? When I looked up again and I kept walking, I lifted my head back up again. He said, I'm wait. we are waiting for you. I said, oh my God, this is real. I, never, I was getting ready to drop my son off at daycare, at the school that he was attending. When I looked in the mirror, mirror he said it again, we're waiting for you. I said to myself, I said, and God told me, deal with it. After that, God began to show me this one spirit controlled the, the neighborhoods, the communities, the schools. I even saw this same spirit behind churches. This one spirit governed the entire land in the Southwest region. I saw it. So when I'm telling you how different things work, how these spirits are territorial. There are certain powers that are there. And these spirit, this spirit of lust, it controls it. This is why the nine times out of ten, you're going to see these spirits govern black communities and Hispanic communities. Because wherever you're going to find, I want you to see how they couple with one another. You're going to find a strip club and you're going to find some type of um, specs. I'll use the name specs or some kind of liquor store. Let me use the name liquor store. Why? Because wherever you're going to find spirits, wine and spirits, and you're going to find these perverted spirits, and you bring them together. Every time you go through some type of community, that's an Hispanic community, that's a black community, you're going to find a liquor store, and you're going to find some kind of strip club. You're going to always find them close together. Why? Because they understand wine and spirits, and lustful spirits, they go hand in hand in every community, just about Hispanic and blacks, you're going to find it. Why? Because they are taking territory. Why do you think they have in commercials where they show so much skin? Nowadays, I mean, they should be X-rated commercials, X-rated movies that's considered to be rated R. Why? Because they're showing so much. Why do they show so much? And I hear what some people say. I've been to the strip club, but I really didn't participate in it. I didn't give anybody any money. That's what you're saying. I didn't give anyone any money. So since I didn't give anyone any money, it's not, I'm not participating. I just went with a couple of my friends. Watch this. Oh, they had a bachelor's party and I was a part of it at the bachelor's party or the bachelorette parties. You didn't touch them, but you watched. Okay, I'm going to give you a scripture. Go to Job chapter 31. Oh, oh. Go to Job chapter 31. No, don't go to Job chapter 31. Go to Matthew chapter 5. Go to Matthew chapter 5. Go to Matthew chapter 5. I want you to go to verse 27. Go to verse 27. Jesus said, now this is a universal scripture, even though it's in reference to men, but it still can be applicable to women. Ye have heard that it was said of them of old times, thou shall not commit Adultery. Verse 28 said, But I say unto you that whomsoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, he committed adultery with her already in his heart. You don't have to touch, all you have to do is look. And by you looking, you have already committed the sin. You've already committed adultery. You have already committed fornication. All because you looked. Jesus is saying how the kingdom work. It's not you touching. It's not just a physical touch. This thing is about you looking. But why is it so significant with just you looking? Because looking establishes stuff in the spirit realm. Because your imagination. Watch this. So once you leave the strip club, after you looked, 
and you saw something that you like, you leave with the imagery in your mind. You leave with the imagery in your imagination. You leave with it. So when you let out and go to sleep at night, the only thing you can see is where you came from. Where you came from came with you. Why? And now you start imagining. The second you say that somebody's fine, the second you start imagining what you'll do and how you'll do it, God said you've already committed the fornication. Why? Because you've already done this thing within your heart. Already God is saying it. So listen, and I'm trying my best. I'm trying. So if you go to a beach, a pool party, and somebody got bikinis or speedos, and you start imagining what you would do, God is saying, because this thing is in your heart. You know what the Bible says? You know, let me, let me tell you this. You know why God destroyed the earth in the beginning? In Genesis chapter 6? He said, because man's heart was wicked. He said, because their imagination and their heart was continually evil. So the second you use your mind in your heart for wickedness, something is birthed in that realm. Because you look for it, you look lustfully. And so how the enemy normally works with lust, he'll have somebody walk around you or walk in front of you with nothing to imagine so that you can come into covenants and so you can think about it, so you can stare at it. And most people are being defeated by this spirit. This is what happened in school. This is what happens when people are young. They're introduced to pornos. Now, one of the most profound revelations that God gave me about pornos, I'm going to show you. Most people are addicted to it. That's why it's a $97 billion a year industry. Most people are addicted by it. Now, I'm going to say something, and I know some of you probably going to get offended when I say it. Most men watch it because of the women. Most women watch it because of the men. Something in the movie, it, it arouses them. It stimulates them. Why? Because it stimulates the mind. And if it stimulates the mind, the body responds to what stimulated the mind. So something is aroused in the person that gets them excited and motivated. Now watch this. And you thinking that it's innocent. The greatest mistake that people make, and I've heard pastors say this, they read the scripture and they said the bedroom is undefiled. And that scripture is absolutely correct. The bedroom is undefiled. Yes, marriage is holy. Yep, sex is part of marriage. It is. But when you start inviting something else into your covenant, then it becomes holy. And now it's defiled. You're inviting an entire industry that didn't come from God. You would invite him in your bedroom. You would invite him in your heart and in your spirit. So now you carry it in your spirit. You carry these lustful spirits in you. So you can't have sex with your wife or your husband until those videos are now played because that's what continues to stimulate you. So what happens is because of your imagery, because of your imagination and because of your heart, that what a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So it goes back to, so now all you want to do, you get hooked on it. Like you're hooked on phonics, that become your phonics. You get hooked on it and all you want to do is this. All you want to watch is this because it's a portal. All it do is draw you in and draws you deeper and deeper. And so what you do, you establish covenants because now you start buying them. Now you can't function. Now you got to watch it on your phone. And I'm talking to people now because I see somebody. I see somebody. You're so addicted to pornography that you all you do is watch it on your phone. You're watching it in your house while your children are around. You're watching it in your house while your wife is around. You're watching it's a male that's doing it. You're watching it on your phone, and I can see you watching it on your phone. You're not even interested in nothing else. But let me tell you this. I told you one of the most profound revelations that God gave me about pornography is this. You may have been watching the women, and all of a sudden the women did something to arouse you. 
And God said, you're not only establishing a covenant with that industry, with that spirit of lust, but he said, the person that aroused you because of your imagination, you just married them. Do you know, <laughs> Lord, y'all got to stay with me. I'm told I'm going to be deep for a second. That any type of ejaculation because stimulation, that means you imagine it in your mind, and now this person becomes your wife. Now, listen, because if it's the man, but if it's the woman, that person just became your husband. You got to understand, I just read it to you scriptorially. This is how it is in the kingdom of God. This is how it is in the spirit realm. So what happens, you think that because the man stimulated you, if you're a woman, that that was it. No, that's not it. You establish a covenant with the man because they were both in the picture. So you got covenants with not only the man, you got a covenant with the woman. So this is why people, I just read to you our foundational scripture, James chapter one, every man is drawn away and enticed by his own lust. So you leave God. And when you leave God, that's when you have natural affections for the same sex. Because you've opened the door to both sexes, male and female. So those spirits come in. I told you the spirit of lust, it doesn't care if it's male or male. It doesn't care if it's female or female. It doesn't care if it's a child. It doesn't care if it's a goat. It doesn't care if it's a horse. It doesn't matter. Because when the spirit of lust comes, it only want to satisfy its desire. Watch this. Even with masturbation. Even with masturbation, what happens in masturbation? Your mind takes you somewhere. Your mind has some type of imagery of a woman or a man. And because of that, lust takes you to a place in the spirit realm until where you release. You have an ejaculation and the spirit of lust is controlling you. This is why teachers... Sleep with students, whether f male or female. This is why they rape kids. This the spirit of the, they have been consumed by it. Because the first thing we never do, we never guard our eye gates. We watch anything and everything. And what has plagued America is TikTok and Facebook. Because people can show themselves and reveal themselves naked. Listen, and it's only a systematic sign that Satan is only using people to get them to be half naked, to get them to be in bikinis or speedos, just to captivate your attention long enough so the spirit can enter in and so you can imagine what you'll do. Not realize it. Remember, he is the prince of the air. So now he's not just being in the second heavens. Now he's in communication systems. He's in networks. He's on TikTok. He's on Facebook. He's on Twitter. Now they're showing and revealing body parts just to get you more involved in it. Just so why? Because they want you to have your own lust. Every man is tempted when he is drawn away. But what do you draw yourself away from? You draw yourself away from holiness, which means God. And the Bible said, when lust is conceived, conceived means a seed must be present. Conception, like a baby, a male gives a seed to a woman and something conceives. You know what that means? Y'all please hear this. That means in order for a woman to get pregnant, she have to ovulate. Whew, whew. She can't get pregnant until there's ovulation, which means it's the time for her to produce. So the enemy intervenes and operates in an individual life when it's time for them to produce. And now all of a sudden they ovulate and the enemy sow his seed first. He sows lust. When lust is conceived, you become pregnant. Pregnant with lust. Pregnant with perversion. All because you were tempted and you didn't understand the temptation. You became pregnant when lust is conceived. I want you to see the pattern. Steal, kill, and destroy. John 10 and 10 says, the thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and destroy. But how is he coming? This time, he's coming in the form of lust. Watch. When lust is conceived, it brings forth sin, which means the action. There's an action that will take place because of the sin, because something was conceived. When sin is finished, it brings forth death. Steal. 
kill and destroy. Look at the pattern. Look at Satan's pedigree. But he's using lust as the means and the methodology in order to destroy people. He's using. So this is why AIDS come and there's no cure. There's well-known rappers that had the same process and died because of AIDS. Full-blown AIDS. They died because of, all well, because of, didn't understand the pedigree. And the enemy was taking their life through lust because they were popular and they can sleep with everybody. But Satan had an agenda. The end of that thing was death. If you're a prime example, hear me. This is why you have to protect your eye gates. And most people don't know that the second you start watching this stuff, it, listen, you don't have to go to, it doesn't have to come to you once you watch it. You will now go to, how you know that lust has been conceived? Listen, it doesn't come to you. The spirit doesn't come to you anymore. How is conceived? You'll get up at 12 o'clock midnight watching it. You'll go in your car to watch it. You'll act like you're going to the grocery store just to watch it on your phone. Why? No longer is the spirit. Now it's drawing you. You're going to it because it came into you. I'm going to show you another couple of instances. I want you to hear this. I told you some of the greatest people that we know scripturally died because of this spirit died because of it. All right. I'm going to show you something scriptorially because most, I think most people think that this is really not an important thing. And we think for some reason, and this is why so many of our preachers, we fail because of this. I want you to go to second Samuel chapter 11. Now, this is a well-known story. Second Samuel chapter 11, well-known story. Second Samuel chapter 11. And I'm going to, I want us to, <laughs> I want us to see something. I'm going to start in verse 11. I'm going to start in verse 1. And I'm talking about guarding your eye gates so this stuff won't enter in. Territorial spirits, I'm talking about this. So many pastors have failed. Listen, whether it's male or female, I know I know what I'm saying. I've, I've seen it. I've been around it. I've watched pastors fail because of this. They didn't understand temptation. One of the prayers, the model of prayers in, in, in Luke chapter 11, when Jesus was talking because he was talking about temptation. And, and I, I think sometimes we won't even use the model of prayer that Jesus gave them. He gave them that and we can take it and apply it to ourselves. He said, lead them not into temptation. Most people think temptation is easy to get out of. Temptation is not easy to get out. So many people have failed because of temptation. They could not. Get past the temptation. Lead them not into temptation, but deliver them from evil. Because temptation will lure you into evil acts, evil works, and evil deeds. It'll lure you somewhere. I'll give you a prime example, okay? I'll give you a prime example, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to get back to Second Samuel chapter 11. Do you don't think that Eve was tempted? Eve was tempted to take the fruit. Now watch this. Let me show you just how much temptation, how strong temptation is. She knew that the fruit was bad. When the serpent asked her, she was not by that tree. Because he asked her a question. Have God not said? She said, God said, not under the, the tree that's in the midst of the garden. She wasn't there. But because... He talked to her so much. She envisioned herself and she went to that tree. Sometimes how you make the mistake. You didn't make the mistake when you slept with the woman. You didn't. You didn't make the mistake when you slept with the man. You made the mistake when you didn't cast the imagination down. You made the mistake when you thought about what you was going to do. If you got to the house, if you got to the hotel, if you got to the motel, if you got to the car, if you got behind the building, you made the mistake when you thought about what you were going to do because it was premeditated because the spirit of lust came in you. The body followed after the mind believed. Watch this. And I told you, this is all a part of your eye gates. It's, and in first, in first John, 
I, I want you to see the Bible said first John it says all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. I'm not going to even get with the pride of life. Is all that's in the world is the lust of the flesh. And the lust of the eyes, the lust of the eyes, you don't get to the lust of the flesh until the eyes are affected, until the eyes are impacted. All that's in the world is the lust of the eyes. So when the enemy comes, he has to give you what I call eye candy. And listen, and I know some people may not consider this because eye candy, you know, candy is good. Because it's sweet, you know, you can have a sweet tooth and all of a sudden you like that eye candy. But if you keep eating candy, sooner or later you'll get diabetes. And the enemy has been giving people spiritual diabetes because of the eye candy that they receive. Lust. It's lust, please say this, the lust of the eyes. And, 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 <laughs> and I'm trying my best. Okay. Second Samuel chapter 11. Verse 1 says this. And it came to pass after the year was expired at the time when kings go forth to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all of Israel. And they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried, watch this, still at Jerusalem. Watch this. He tarried still at Jerusalem. There's a battle. A king, a Simon, was to go in battle with his men. But David tarried and stayed at Jerusalem. The greatest mistake that he can make, he was out of position. He was out of place. He should have been in the battle. He was getting ready to come into a battle that he didn't know that he was getting ready to come into. But the battle was waiting for him. See, David could destroy Goliath's giants. He can destroy the Philistines. He can destroy armies of people, but he didn't know how to handle women. And he was getting ready to come into a battle because he missed the battle. Had he been with his men, he would have never had this battle. See, that's what I'm saying. You can be at the wrong place at the wrong time and something will transpire and take place in your life. David was in the wrong place, which he thought was the right place. At the wrong time. Watch it. Watch verse two. And it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose off. Watch this. His bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman and one said, is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her and she came in unto him and he laid with her for she was purified from uncleanliness. And she returned to her house. She was purified from uncleanliness, but David defiled her. In other words, he raped her. This wasn't consensual. If she didn't sleep with the king and back in these days, David wasn't going to jail, but he could kill you. They, they didn't have the rights that we have, but because he saw her, Lust came into her, him, and all of a sudden he sent men to take her. I want you to see how lust works. He saw her. All that's in the world is the lust of the eyes. He saw her and then took her. Listen, he wasn't single. He had already had multiple wives, but what did he see about her? that he would take her. It was the lust of the eyes and the flesh, the lust of his flesh responded after the lust of the eyes. It consumed him. So he took her, slept with her and sent her home. 
this is why I keep telling you and keep expressing that you have to guard your eye gates. You have to protect your spirit and your soul. A lot of things that come into our life come through our eyes, comes through what we see, what we watch, what we hear. It comes through. This is how it reaches the soul. This is why the Bible said, if the eyes be single, the body is full of light. If you don't know what light is, light is revelation, it's understanding, it's clarity, but light also means Christ. You are the light of the world. In order for us to see, light has to travel. If you don't understand when it comes to um, ophthalmology, light goes to the back of the eyes that projects an image. We see the image upside down, but the brain turns the image right back up. But light has to reach, go through the cornea goes through our eyes in order for us to project the image or the picture. So light, if the body is full of light, then it's full of Christ. But if the eyes be not single, then the body is full of darkness. The second that David saw this young lady taking a bath, the second that that happened, darkness came into David. And I want you to see this. And I know sometimes we can have nightmares, but the enemy can wake you up out of your sleep too. wake you up out of your sleep to feed your flesh fetish. He saw her and had wives with him, but he took her and he slept with her and then sent her home after he defiled her. Look at what lust does. See, in our time, we were called David a rapist because he raped her. He took her from her husband, knowing that she was married, and established a covenant with her only to defile her because every man is enticed when he is drawn away by his own lust. When he is drawn away. But what did he draw himself away from God? Now watch the generational effects. But it all transpired because David wanted this woman so bad he killed Uriah, her husband. I want you to see this, please. He killed Uriah's, his soldiers, one of his best men, put him on the front line, had him to go to war, and had the men to fall back so that he can die, so that he can keep the woman. Look at what lust does. Lust heals. So you find people that are jealous, and they're killing people, their ex-girlfriend, their ex-boyfriend, their ex-husband. No, it ain't because of that. They don't want anybody else to have what they've had. So because of lust, lust say, if I can't have you, then nobody else can have you. So I'm going to kill you, kill him, and then kill myself. That's what lust does. Lust kills. David killed one of his soldiers, one of his best men. And God sent Nathan the prophet. And David put his entire family in jeopardy because he didn't know how to protect his eye gates. And the Bible said Nathan told him, the sword David would never leave your house. His entire children, his lineage would not live. Everybody in his house would die or fail because David didn't know how to protect his eye gates. When the spirit of lust came, his son raped his daughter, Tamar. Raped because David raped. That what a man sold, that shall he also. She, he defiled his own sister. Lust came into him because lust came into David. It had now access to his kids. David was perverted, so now his children is going to be perverted. And she defiled, Tamar was defiled by Adonai, which means her own brother. He raped her, brought her to his house, just as David brought Bathsheba to his house. He brought his sister to his house, act like he was sick, and raped her. And she begged him, don't defile me. If you're going to marry me, then go ahead and go to David. Go to my father and ask him. He'll allow you to do it. But he didn't do that. So he raped her, sent her home, and then it said he hated her after he raped her and sent her home. Why? Because David opened the door to a bloodline curse, and it trickled down, and it hit his family. Hear this. That wasn't the end. It wasn't the end. One of the greatest men scriptorially. Mr. Wisdom, richest man in the world. Solomon could not stand the chance to his father's curse. 
the spirit of lust and perversion it's no respect as a person it don't care how much wisdom you have Solomon had all the wisdom that he needed the discerning heart to be able to discern but could not discern his own father's curse and Solomon watch this had 1,000 wives what in the I, I, I know people are saying that's man that's a ain't no way in the world you can sleep with that many women there's no way but in order for Solomon to marry them, he had to sleep with them. You see the fetish, you see the obsession. In our day and time, we would call him a nymphomaniac. Nymphos are only consumed by lust, and that spirit only desires to satisfy his appetite. So the thousand wasn't even enough. He dies by building altars, losing his kingdom. Because of his father's curse, because his father couldn't control his eyesight. Look at how lust came in and destroyed an entire family. Because all that's in the world is the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. Go to Job chapter 31 and verse 1. Job chapter 31 and verse 1. Job 31, verse 1. This is Job talking. I want you to hear what Job said. Most people just think that Job wasn't intelligent, neither was he smart. We just see the calamity that he went through, but we don't know what God began to teach Job in his calamity. You can see why God loved Job so much just with this verse. When God, when God allowed Satan to tempt or test the individual, he knew that that individual had a good. God said, there's no one like him in all the earth. Do you know that God separated Job based on Job? Life? And God has shown us in detail. One of the reasons he loved Job so much is right here in Job chapter 31 and verse 1. Because Job knew how to manage and control his spirit. He knew how to protect his spirit and his soul. The soul controls the mind, the intellect, and the will. So because Job understood how to protect his mind, his intellect, his will, his spirit, and his soul, because he understood that, and this is how he protected it. Watch. Job chapter 31, verse 1, I made a covenant with my eyes. Wait a minute. You make covenants with God. You make covenants with Satan. You make covenants when you get married. Job said, I made a covenant with my eyes. How did he know what kind of, you see the kind of revelation and understanding that he had, that he knew that if, if I look at somebody the wrong way, let me finish the scripture. Why then should I look upon a maid? Job understood the dangers by him looking, not touching looking and Jesus would come back and say it in Matthew chapter 5 of 27 and verse 28 that if a man so happened to look at a woman this is why God was so in love with Job's life while well, he allowed Job to be taken by Job to be tempted by Satan why because he said there's none like him in all the earth I made a covenant with my eyes that I will not look upon a young man because he understood the significance behind perversion lust and temptation Now, I, I know we understand that some of the greatest men fail because of this. Some of the greatest men fail. You remember the person by the name of Samson? As strong as Samson was, he can tear. Watch this. When the lion roared and the spirit of the Lord came upon Samson, he took the lion's mouth and ripped him in half. Look how strong Samson. Samson would tear off the gates of a city. Tear off the gates of a city. But every man is tempted and drawn away by his own lust and enticed. Samson wanted to marry a Philistine, somebody who was outside of the covenant. I told you spirits are territorial. The entire Philistines nation region, that entire region was covered by perversion. It was covered in it. The spirits controlled it. 
So when Samson married somebody outside of the covenant, all he wanted was that woman because he stepped in the Philistines territory. It was territorial. He couldn't fight the spirit because he didn't know the spirit of God came upon him, but he couldn't fight the spirit. If it was natural, he could have dealt with it. But when it was spiritual, he didn't understand it. So listen, he sleeps and marries a Philistine and they killed the Philistine that he's married to. And the Bible said in, in, in Judges chapter 16, while he's in Gaza, he's a Nazarite. He was supposed to be holy, but yet he went and slept with a prostitute. You see how the spirit of lust is because it's surrounding the territory. He sleeps with a prostitute and they wait for Samson at night. Midnight because they know he's sleeping with a prostitute. He's back in the same territory and going through the same debates, going through the same fights. And listen, he tore off the gates of a city and walked out of the gates with the city, but left with a covenant, left with the covenant and the curse. And ultimately, we know the story of Samson, that he would get hooked up with Delilah. Delilah ain't care nothing about Samson. She ain't care about his eyes. She ain't care about his feelings because it's territorial spirits and spirits of perversion only want to know your weakness. So let me say this. So you're going to go to somebody's house. I got it. We're just going to watch a movie. And you go and watch a movie. And listen, you can watch Captain America. Nothing provocative, just watching a movie. You can watch a, a chick flick, no matter what it is. You can watch um, them building, rebuilding houses, no matter what you watch. But because the person is so perverted, his entire atmosphere... Her entire atmosphere, that spirit of perversion, and it's waiting for you to get there. Why? So you can reveal your weakness in everything that she said. And she got, Delilah got Samson in her house, and the house was perverted. The atmosphere was perverted. The whole entire system, it never once recorded that he slept with her. All she worked with was his mind, his imagination. And she wore him down in that atmosphere. He was so blind that he could not even pay attention that she was trying to trick him to find out what his weakness is. And he had his head on her lap. You know what that means? He had his head on it. What was he imagining? What was he picturing with his head on her lap? He wasn't even thinking straight because of the atmosphere. So some people can go to people's atmospheres. You never had the intention that you were going to sleep with them. And all of a sudden it became a one night stand. And you don't even know what happened, but you were seduced by those spirits. And when you woke up, it was too late. Why? Because the spirit of lust came. And you could not get past the temptation because you didn't know that somebody was getting ready to entice you to find out your weaknesses. And all of a sudden, somebody put their hand around you while you're watching a movie and just bring your clothes and put your head on their chest or the person put their head in your chest. All of a sudden, and you don't know that these are these are strategic ways to break you. Listen, if the person carries the spirit of lust. And you're in the atmosphere of the spirit of lust. And you like the person. Sooner or later, the spirit of lust transfers and it's too late. Off goes the lights and it's over. The movie is still on. Because you're projecting moves or movies in your mind now. Yeah, the movie's still on. But now you're doing something completely different and you're no longer watching the movie because the enemy set you up for that environment. And Samson went into an environment that was polluted and contaminated with the spirit of lust. And she found out his weakness. See, the weakness wasn't just where his hair was. His hair was the covenant that him and God established. She was after the covenant. When she broke the covenant, she knew that he would be weak because his strength was God. It was the spirit of God that came upon him. So everybody persecuted him. They, they took out his eyes, which means his vision. They cut his hair and they made sport of him. And the enemy desires to destroy your vision and to make sport of you with the spirit of lust. 
He's looking for your weakness. He's looking for it. And this has been the problem in the body of Christ. Because most people never see it coming. God destroyed an entire city, cities. In Genesis chapter 18, he destroys Sodom and Gomorrah because the spirit of lust consumed the city. It consumed the men. Well, even the men tried to sleep with angels because they thought the angels were just mere men because of lust. But let me tell you this. God is a God that can get you out of your situation. He can get you out of your problem. He can remove you from temptation. That's why the Bible said that God will make a way of escape with you, even with the temptation. That even though it's present, God said, I still make a way of escape. You know, God gives us this revelation in Genesis chapter 20, 21, I think it is 20. Well, God is talking to King Abimelech when he took Sarah. He took Sarah and said, God said, go back. I want you to give that man back his wife. Or I'll kill you. And King Abimelech said, Lord, will you kill an innocent man knowing that I'm innocent? He said that is his sister. And God said, yes. He said, I am the one that kept you from sleeping with her. God took away his desire. Listen to what I'm trying to tell you. God said, I'll make a way of escape, even with the temptation. If you can just yield to me in it, I'll make a way of escape so that temptation won't take you out. So that lust won't consume you. So that perversion won't lead you. He said, I'll make a way of escape. And God is trying to get you to see that he's trying to make a way of escape. He's trying to get you to move. He don't even want you caught in the territory. And let me tell you this. You are no individual. If you find a person that you're going to marry and the issue that they have, they want to try before they buy They want to try it first. This ain't Sam's. You don't get samples. Sam's give you samples hoping that you're going to buy the real thing. Some people, you know, the phrase that we used to use, curiosity kills the cat. And because some people are so curious, they want to try it before they marry you. And they try it, and then they don't want to marry you, but they establish the covenant. All because... That person was consumed by lust. Let me tell you this. This Okay. If somebody tell you they want to marry you without a date, be careful. They can go show you rings. They can even talk about babies' names. Y'all can go look at houses. It's all a facade. This, listen to me. I'm telling you. They got people that will talk about marriage that will take you about home and sell you the whole thing about marriage, about family, about the American dream, but you never see them established in a wedding date. Those are masters of lust. They have mastered their art to sleep with you. You'll be another notch on their belt or a notch on their dress. They're mastering it. They're master manipulators only to bring you into a moment to sell you a dream. In my neighborhood, we say wolf cookies. Or we say, I sell you a jelly roll. You're selling your soul for a jelly roll. Because these people are contaminated. They are polluted. And all they want to do is satisfy their itch with you. Be careful who you touch, who you get in touch with. You have to guard yourself at all times. 
when it comes to this spirit. I'm telling you, this spirit has went rampant upon this entire earth. It's out of control. And the reason that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, because he didn't have a man to stand in the gap. He didn't have nobody to petition. Abraham said, if you find 10 in the city. But Moses said, Lord, if you do it, do it for me. You have to learn. Abraham was still young when it came to his walk with Christ. But Moses said, Lord, because God said, I'm going to kill all of them. And I'm going to start with God said, if Moses said, if you're going to kill them, Lord, start with me. But what about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Moses was mature in his prayer life. And what the enemy's main objective is, when God sees these kind of lustful spirits, these spirits of perversion, immediately he wanted to destroy cities, nations, because these spirits have infiltrated this entire world. And God is trying to bring you into an awareness. Lead them not into temptation. But Lord, deliver me from evil. Temptation is not easy. Enticement is not easy. Seducing is not easy. I'm going to say this. I'm going to leave it right here. Jezebel desired to kill Elijah. Jezebel seduced Ahab. Got it? Jezebel seduced Ahab. Spirits don't die. They won't die until the end. Jezebel dies, but the spirit lives. Now, we know the spirit of Jezebel lived because when you look in Revelation, the Bible said that she was teaching. She was a prophetess in the church. She dies in Kings, but she's a prophetess. So that spirit lived. Elijah goes to heaven. But the Bible said that John the Baptist carried the spirit of Elijah. Jesus said it. But how did John the Baptist die? He died because the queen daughter danced for the king. She danced and she danced for the king. And the Bible said, he said, I'll give you anything in my kingdom, half of my kingdom, whatever you ask. Because he carried the spirit of Elijah. Jezebel's spirit still lived. It went inside the young girl. And when she danced, the king, King Agrippa, Herod, King Herod, that was his name, King Herod, danced and he got seduced and John the Baptist's head got cut off. Because the battle still persists. The spirit of perversion killed the spirit that he had, which was Elijah. It was perversion. The same spirit that tried to kill Elijah back then said, by this time tomorrow, if you won't be like one of the prophets that you had killed, that spirit came back and got in the girl. So, oh, y'all, okay. Give me two more minutes. There's an artist right now. There's an artist. And we all know she's a famous artist. She has said this time and time in her interviews. Her name is Beyonce. And Beyonce said in one of her interviews that she didn't know how to dance. But she said one day she got ready to go on stage and she lifted up her hands and a spirit entered into her body by the name of Sasha. She even made a song, an album, by Sasha. Listen, so every time she dances, she's seducing, getting men to be drawn into the spirit of love by coming into their imagination and their mind, and then she's half naked. And we don't see it. We don't see the spirit that's being released. So now you got young boys 
that's imagining sleeping with Beyonce. You got women that's sleeping with, thinking about sleeping with Beyonce. You have men that's sleeping, thinking about, pastors sleeping, thinking about sleeping with Beyonce. And we don't see it. That's this entire world. Commercials, that's all you see. It can be a chewing gum commercial and somebody half naked. Potato chip commercial, they have naked. This is why our children have gotten so perverted and they're having children as children. Why? Because even the cartoons are revealing skin. Leaving nothing to the imagination. And they're being consumed by these spirits. I pray that something tonight captivated your attention, woke you up. And the enemy, he's so smooth, you can be watching a football game and all of a sudden the commercial come on, nothing but skin. And the commercial goes off and the football game comes back on, but it turns on something in your spirit. Be careful. If you know people go to strip clubs, you know people watch pornos. You know people who struggle with masturbation. These are not natural acts. They're not. These are spirits that desire to be transferred. And they're trying to transfer into you. And you have to be real careful. Because what these spirits see they don't have, they come after. So be real careful in this season about the spirit of lust. Ask God for help. Most people won't refuse to ask God for help. You know you're struggling. Ask God. God for help. He'll help you. He'll deliver you. He'll set you free from lust. And you can't look back once he do. Why? Because he desires for you to be free. When the woman at the well in Samaria went into the city. She came out and all the men came to Jesus because they knew her issue. So some people may have considered her to be a garden too. Jesus would catch a woman the Pharisees would catch a woman in adultery. Come and throw her before Jesus and say she was caught in adultery. Now watch this. They brought the woman. But where was the man? If she was caught, then they had to catch the man too. They let the man go free because she was, he was probably one of the Pharisees. He was a preacher. They let him go free, but threw it before Jesus. But here's the thing. Jesus forgave the woman, but the man is still stuck in the sin. You may have been the one that's been caught. You may have been the one that was operating in adultery. And Jesus said, he, he told all the people that picked up stones, he was without sin, cast the first one. You cast the first one if you without sin. But listen, this is what God is trying to tell you today. That I forgive you of all of your sins. Everything that you have done, I forgive you. I understand, listen, if he can turn the life of Rahab around, whew, 
and bring something beautiful out of Rahab. Obed Edom, which would come to Jesse, which would come to David. He would use Rahab, a big time hoochie mama who struggled with lust, with perversion, sleeping with men that came into the city, but he would make something that was ugly now beautiful. He would make something that was broken, but he would yet fix it. He would save an entire family through somebody who struggled with lust and then bring her into the fold. Rahab was Jesus' great, great, great grandmother. Didn't realize it from somebody who struggled with lust. Prostitution was part of Jesus' bloodline. If he did it for Rahab, the hoochie mama, if he did it for the woman at the well, if he did it for the woman that was caught in adultery, do you not think that he would do it for you? Each woman had major issues. Struggled with perversion and lust. They were caught. And he said, where are your accusers? And people may accuse you of being a garden tool. They may have accused you for not being holy, not being sanctified, and not being righteous. They may have called you a prostitute or a slut. They may have called you these names. But today what God is trying to tell you, he's going to set you free from lust and perversion and temptation. Listen, because he's going to make a way of escape. But he's saying, he told the woman, where are your accusers? He said, if you don't find your accusers, neither will I accuse you. And God is telling you that because I went to the cross and because you came to me, neither will I accuse you. Even though lust has abused you. But he said, this time, sin no more. You know what God did? He just expunged your sins. He said, I, your sins are as far as the east is from the west. I don't remember your sins anymore. Because lust is a stronghold. And tonight he's delivering you from your stronghold. And I'm... <laughs> One of the struggles that some people have, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop here. Some teachers, because this is what I see. Some teachers are not sleeping with men. You're masturbating. It's a woman. It's a woman. But you're a teacher, and you teach little kids. And you're laying your hands on all the kids and not realize you're imparting that spirit. And God is telling you tonight, stop masturbation. One more scripture. God just gave it to me. One more scripture. First Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter six. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm going to start in verse 15. It says, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? That's exactly what Samson did took what was holy, was a Nazarite, never cutting his hair, never drinking any strong drink, and slept with a prostitute. He made this body a member of a harlot. Okay. Watch this. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? For two saith he shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. 
flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committed fornication sinneth against his own body. Watch this. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Watch this. Which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. Verse 20. I'm done. For ye were bought with the price. Watch this. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit. And I know that we think that these bodies belong to us. How do you glorify God in your body? I told you, if you commit fornication, fornication is you having sex outside of marriage or having sex with somebody else that's married. You're committing fornication. But he said, you're doing this against your own body. This is why people get sick. This is where covenants are established. He said, two shall say they shall be one flesh because you slept with that person. You established a covenant with that person, but lust was the spiritual tie. Perversion was the spiritual tie. I'm done when I say this. You know how dogs are when they say dogs are in heat? It's like a season. There are seasons to where animals themselves go into heat. Not understanding that when we go into those seasons, it's because the spirit of lust and perversion is there. And sometimes it's strong. That you got to satisfy yourself one way or another. But God is trying tonight to set you free and deliver you from the doors that you have opened. You have opened doors. And these spirits are crying out for self-pleasures and self-desires and self-gratification. But tonight, God is trying to give you him as a replacement. Listen, I thank you for tuning in tonight on the Vision Channel, on Merge. I'll see you next Monday on the Vision Channel.